In this lesson, we will discuss Hilbert's axioms of continuity and parallelism. We've already looked at David Hilbert's axioms of incidence, betweenness, and congruence, but there's still some more axioms needed to fill in a number of gaps in Euclid's elements. In this lesson, we're going to look at the axioms of continuity and parallelism. Earlier in the semester, when we looked at compass and straight edge constructions, we actually looked at Euclid's first proposition, where he states that given any segment, there's an equilateral triangle having the given segment as one of its sides. The idea of the proof is to draw two circles, each centered at the endpoints of the given line segment, then where the two circles meet, that becomes the third point of the equilateral triangle. And since all of the sides are radii, then those sides are congruent. But the problem is that Euclid assumes that when two circles intersect, they actually intersect at a point. So Euclid assumes that these two circles intersect at a point even though this might be clearly obvious when we draw two circles like this, that they're going to intersect in two points, we can't just use a diagram to justify something that seems obvious. So we actually need another axiom. So before we give another axiom, we're actually going to need the following definitions. We say a point P is inside a circle with center O and radius OR if segment OP is less than segment OR. So here is an example of P inside the circle centered at O. And then we say a point P is outside the circle with center O and radius OR if OP is greater than OR. So this is an example of P being outside the circle. Now let's state the circular continuity principle, which will be included in our continuity axioms. If a circle C has one point inside and one point outside another circle C prime, then the two circles intersect in two points. So this principle was needed to prove Euclid's first proposition. It's actually needed to prove Euclid's 22nd proposition as well. Next, we'll look at a useful consequence of the circular continuity principle called the elementary continuity principle. If one endpoint of a segment is inside a circle and the other outside, then the segment intersects the circle. So the idea of continuity principles has to denote that, imagine drawing a segment where you start inside a circle and going outside a circle, then if you draw that segment without picking up your pencil, you're going to cross the circle and that's the, the point of intersection. This next continuity axiom is a consequence of Dedekind's continuity axiom, which we'll present later. This axiom is actually needed so that we can assign a positive real number as the length of an arbitrary segment. So we call this Archimedes axiom. It says that if CD is any segment, A any point, and R any ray with vertex A, then for every point B not equal to A on ray R, there exists a number N such that when CD is laid off N times on ray R starting at A, a point E is reached on ray R such that N times CD is congruent to AE. And either B is equal to E or B is between A and E. So intuitively, this axiom says that if you arbitrarily choose a segment CD as a unit of length, then every other segment has a finite length with respect to this unit. So this isn't exactly just a geometric axiom because it states that some number n exists. So let's look at the example below. We have a segment CD and let's use this segment CD as our unit of length. And we have another segment AB here that's on ray R. Then we can lay out copies of CD 
So there's one, two, three, and then four, four units of length CD will give us the result that we need. So we see that point B is now between points A and E on the end of this segment. And so we, so this segment AE would be congruent to four times CD. So we can use this axiom to use an arbitrary segment as a unit of length. But another way to look at it is if we say we let AB be our unit of length, then we can use Archimedes' axiom to say that no other segment can be infinitesimally small with respect to this unit. So for example, CD with respect to length AB is at least one fourth units. So the next axiom is going to be a consequent of Archimedes' axiom. This is Aristotle's axiom. It states that given any side of an acute angle and any segment AB, there exists a point Y on the given side of the angle such that if X is the foot of the perpendicular from Y to the other side of the angle, then XY is greater than AB. So the idea is if we start with any point Y on a given side of an angle, then as Y recedes endlessly from the vertex V of the angle, the perpendicular segment XY increases indefinitely. As I mentioned, this statement is actually a consequence of Archimedes axiom and all the previous axioms. The useful corollary of Aristotle's axiom is let AB be any ray, P be any point not collinear with A and B, and angle XVY any acute angle. Then there exists a point R on ray AB such that angle PRA is less than angle XVY. So if we start with any point R on ray AB, then as R recedes endlessly from the vertex A of the ray, then angle PRA decreases to zero because it's eventually smaller than any previously given angle XVY. All four of the principles that we've stated so far are in the spirit of the ancient Greek geometry but they're actually all consequences of this next axiom, which is a very modern axiom called Dedekind's axiom. Dedekind's axiom states that suppose the set of all points on a line L is the disjoint union S1 union S2, so it's disjoint, meaning no points are in common of these two sets, and of two non-empty subsets of the points on L. So these are non-empty subsets and they're disjoint. So all the points in the line are in this disjoint union such that no point of either subset is between two points of the other. Then there exists a unique point O on line L such that one of the subsets is equal to a ray of L with vertex O and the other subset is equal to the complement. So Dedekind's axiom says that any separation of points on line L into left and right is produced by a unique point O. So given a pair of subsets with the properties in this axiom, we call this pair a Dedekind cut of the line. So Dedekind's axiom ensures that a line L has no holes in it. So you can read in the textbook how the other four statements that we already gave are consequences of Dedekind's axiom. So this really is the only continuity axiom we need. And with Dedekind's axiom, it actually enables us to introduce a rectangular coordinate system into the plane and do geometry analytically 
like Rene Descartes and Fermat discovered in the 17th century. Next, we're going to finish up our study of Hilbert's axioms by giving the historically most controversial axiom, the Hilbert's axiom of parallelism. Hilbert's axiom states that for every line L and for every point P not lying on L, there is at most one line M through P such that M is parallel to L. So you should recognize that this sounds very familiar to the Euclidean parallel postulate, but this axiom is actually weaker in that it asserts only that at most one line passes through P, whereas the Euclidean parallel postulate asserts that at least one line through P is parallel to L. And the reason why we don't need at least in Hilbert's axiom is that it can be proved from the other axioms. So it's actually enough to just state that at most one line M through P such that M is parallel to L exists. So this is the last of the Hilbert's axioms. We're going to look at neutral geometry, which consists of all the geometric theorems that can be proved using only the axioms of incidence, betweenness, congruence, and continuity and without using the axiom of parallelism. Bolia actually called this type of geometry absolute geometry, but this name is a bit misleading because it doesn't include elliptic geometry and other geometries. So the preferred name now is neutral geometry, as it signifies that we're going to be remaining neutral about the controversial axiom of parallelism. We define a Euclidean plane to be a model for all of the Hilbert axioms, incidence, betweenness, congruence, continuity, and parallelism. And so we'll end with an example of a Euclidean plane. The points of this interpretation are gonna be all ordered pairs x, y of real numbers. Then a line is gonna be determined by an ordered triple u, v, w of real numbers such that either u is non-zero or v does not equal zero. And then a line is gonna be the set of all points x, y that satisfy the linear equation ux plus vy plus w equals zero. Incidence is set membership. So a point is on a line when that point x, y satisfies the linear equation uh, associated with that ordered triple. We can define distance between two points in this real plane by the usual Pythagorean formula for the distance from A to B as the square root of A1 minus B1 squared plus A2 minus B2 squared. To continue this example, we're going to define the notation B between A and C to mean that the distance from A to C is equal to the distance from A to B plus the distance from B to C. Then we can define congruent segments, A, B, and C, D, to mean that the distance from A to B is equal to the distance from C to D. We're going to define congruent angles in the following way. We say that angle A, B, C is congruent to angle D, E, F. If you can choose the points A, C, D, and F on the sides of these angles so that segment AB is congruent to ED, CB is congruent to FE, and AC is congruent to DF. Then it can be verified that this model actually satisfies all the axioms for Euclidean geometry and is therefore is a Euclidean plane.